why we're here and um, you know and uh, there may be others folks I know from each of the groups represented here that are uh, in the audience today as well as other folks that are also engaging in this community rights work and we'll get into more about what we mean by community rights. Uh, I guess maybe before we start, is this kind of a brand new thing for folks? I mean, you kind of just go through the program and say, hey, this sounds interesting, or are folks coming into this knowing something about this work already? Maybe just see quick hands, is this something really brand new for folks? So everyone else has kind of got some association. I recognize the faces of folks from here from Eugene, and I know that I'm following this stuff as other folks. So. Um, we're going to try to keep it as informational from a starting standpoint as we can. Uh, we may devolve into talking more, more complexly, uh, depending on where things go. But we'll try to keep it really introductory, I guess. So, so that's kind of where we're heading for the time that we have with one another. Uh, we'll just do quick introductions. My name is Kai Hushka. I'm a community organizer with a group called the Community Environmental League. Fun. I'm Ann Nealand. I'm a Eugene-based attorney who's representing two petitioners of the three groups here today. I'm also a member of local um, support local food rights and community rights in county based here in the I'm Harry McCormick. I'm uh, out of the fact that I'm a farmer and a writer. Uh, I was one of the founding, we call ourselves a steering committee uh, for Benton County Community Rights Coalition. And we have an ordinance that's in action right now. I'm Michelle Holman. I'm a member of Community Rights in the County and support local food rights. I live in Coast Range, a longtime activist, frustrated with traditional activism, and uh, stoked about community rights. My name is Audrey Moore. I'm from Selma. Um, I'm a retiree, retiree who became a birth advocate, if you will. Um, and um, we've also, I'm co-founding member of Freedom from Pesticides Alliance. All right, so uh, each, as I said, each of us is going to kind of provide you guys with a little bit of kind of the overall picture. We're all going to try to keep our stuff to about five minutes or so, so we have more time to, uh, to talk amongst yourselves. Um, a little background on the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. We're a nonprofit law firm. Uh, started in Pennsylvania in 1995. Uh, did what we would call, I guess, regular conventional environmental law for about five, six years and have been doing the work that we do today uh, since then. Uh, we are active in about 12 different states. Uh, we've worked with probably about 500 different communities, whether directly with citizen groups or with municipal officials. Uh, we've also engaged in work internationally. Um, I guess our most noted work was with uh, Ecuador a few years back. Uh, actually helped their constitutional convention to write something into their federal constitution that no other constitution has on the planet currently, which is recognizing nature's rights. And we'll get into more about what I mean by that later on. Uh, also working in places like Nepal uh, and Australia and different places around the globe as I think people are coming to uh, the same conclusion as the folks made said here in the introduction is that, man, maybe the things that we have been doing really aren't sufficient Maybe we really need to change up our approach and our direction and come at it from a very different vantage point. Um, so our work really starts with being uh, someone makes contact with us, and that's how we, we get engaged with communities. And that's the communities facing something in which they find a threat to their community and they get a hold of us. Uh, we always joke it's helpful because when, we're, when we say that we're free, of course, people like that because well, there's money involved. So. That's how we've operated since the beginning. The, our legal services are free, our organizing support services are free. But the whole idea was to make ourselves accessible to community groups so that the issues they were facing, that they didn't have another hurdle to deal with, which is the financial stuff. Not to say that's still not a factor, but at least from our end, we try to minimize that or eliminate that. So, in some ways, you know, this term community rights um, is a way I think that we try to shorthand what this work is about. It's probably not the best term, but it's a way to maybe give an entry point about this idea of community and where rights reside. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's about who's making decisions in your community today. Quite often what we find out when we're faced with a thread, it's not us. Someone else has already made a decision about what our community is going to get. And we can set obviously a very huge disadvantage. 
especially when we have mobilized to say no to the company, and we find out that we're in a position um, not to be able to do that. Uh, and is going to talk later more about sort of what that actually looks like from a legal perspective. Because so much of this is then gets driven into the law and gets vetted through the law, and it shapes not only um, things like legal decisions and government, but really shapes our own behavior, shapes our own culture, because it has such a powerful effect on what we think is doable or what is not doable. And I think this work is really about shattering all of that. Um, it's about embracing a, a very different paradigm about really where power resides. So the community rights orientation is to say, well, rights are actually inherent in people. The only purpose of government is actually to protect those rights. And that's the fundamental purpose of government. And you can turn to whatever state you may live in to the first article typically of your constitution, and there is the validation at least to that idea that rights are inherent in people and government is set up for the sake of the people. And a lot of them actually say if government isn't functioning anymore the way it should be, which is primarily supposed to be about rights, then it's the, it's the, the people's right to actually alter or abolish that form of government and put something new in place. I think that's in essence a lot of the, the energy, the sentiment, the motivation, the drive coming out of the community rights work in the country is really based in that reality of this idea of rights. Um, unfortunately, as uh, communities find, the structure of law has a very different view about what rights and whose rights usually get protected. And as this um, topic today, this, the title for the workshop today, you know, we, there's corporations in there. And the reality is corporations have really evolved to the place where they have more rights than people, whether individually or collectively. Um, but there, it's not the only entity that we have to deal with, but it's become the major of course, economic entity of which we face, so that's a lot of where our action goes towards. So it's very understandable that corporations have um, gotten just the ire from the people, and one can probably say also the ire from the planet, um, by, the, by, the, by those corporate activities and what they're actually inflicting. Um, so just to kind of walk quickly through you know, the scenario, and you'll hear from others about their own stories, but like I said, it's typically there's an issue comes up. So we've dealt with issues like factory farming, and corporate sludging, and coal mining, and fracking, um, now here in Oregon a lot with GMOs and pesticides. Um, there's something in which a community doesn't want. Uh, and when they look to the existing system, they find out they have no real remedy to say no to that let alone a lot of these discussions, of course, about getting beyond just the harm, but actually instituting the good stuff, we also find that we can't do that. We often say that today that sustainability, however you want to play with that term, um, is illegal today because we have a system that doesn't want to recognize truly sustainable behavior or healthy behavior or localizing our systems in a way that we want to do because the system is actually designed to do something very different. So as far as the law and governance goes, it doesn't want to recognize that. So here again, we're, we're running up against a, a, a massive wall before we even get out of the, out of the starting block. Um, in the communities we've worked with, they've in essence, a lot of ways, have rejected these, these models of, of law, and in essence have started to challenge these legal doctrines out there, all emanating from this idea that they have the rights to do so. What that has led to is the rejection of uh, corporate projects that they find harmful, the validations of rights within that community, whether it's the right to clean air or clean water, the rights to sustain the food system or the energy system, and is to say that that corporate activity can't take place in our community because guess what? It's violating the rights that which we hold to be at a higher level and your corporate practice that we want to inflict upon us. There are about 160 communities now who have passed these types of laws. In essence, they are pushing it against the current dominant structure to say no more. Uh, what that has done also is it's led to now about eight states who have now begun to formulate community rights networks. So in essence, taking the local activity, starting to stitch that energy together to begin looking at state level as well as national level constitutional change. To actually get to the point to recognize the inherent rights stuff that our state constitution supposedly hold in high manner, but don't really, in practice, do. So in essence, to begin to really reverse how government, in essence, a lot of way decisions are really made. If it's not the bottom up, if it's not the grassroots, 
who's actually making greater decisions about what takes place in their communities, we will continue to get the harms and the damages that we continue to get under the current structure as it stands. So this is very much about a bottom-up approach, you know, in some ways, the beginnings of what could be a significant movement to actually reverse how decisions are made, and actually putting a governmental structure in place that puts rights at the forefront, which seems like a strange comment. But when we start to look more closely at how the Constitution is structured, how laws actually operate, it's very difficult for rights to actually be recognized and enforced. The other difficulty uh, in the rights category is we have a system now that says government can't violate your Bill of Rights protections at the state and federal level. But we also have corporations that are seen just the same as people under the law. And guess what? Corporations don't have to worry about violating your constitutional rights because they're not the government. <laughs> so we've created a monster out there so that corporations have evolved to something greater than government in which they don't even have to recognize fundamental rights of which government is supposed to be recognized. So we have this, this other entity out there um, in a lot of ways that's dictating what we do at the community level. It's not recognizing fundamentally what should be protected, which is rights. And this community rights work is really about flipping all that stuff on its head and really driving in that new direction, which is a direction that we always thought this country was founded upon and we always thought we were operating within, but that we just sort of forgot. I think the community rights work is saying, well, a lot of the stuff we actually never did, and we have to do it now. And not only for our own community's sake, but ecologically speaking. And we're pretty well screwed, and so we have to, in essence, go in this very sort of new direction, even though it's standing on the ground with some, some old thought, or some actually inherent feelings that we all have individually or collectively. It's also led to uh, the state of Colorado, there's a community rights network there, who has made the decision to actually put a state initiative into play. This work has been happening at the community level. We now have a state that actually said, well, this stuff does have to get up to the state level. We're actually going to attempt to make a constitutional amendment in Colorado that actually recognizes the right to local self-government. And it's, there's more language to that, but basically it says that localities should have the ability to have the authority to recognize and protect rights and elevate rights protected on the base of the fit. And in essence, it's not about reducing rights, but about elevating rights at the community level feels it's necessary. And if that means rejecting, extracting, or factory farming and doing, doing so because that violates the rights of which they want to protect, or not what a valid, sustainable food system or energy system looks like, well, that they would have the authority to do so. And unfortunately, our system of law doesn't work that way today. I think Anne's going to talk more about what that looks like. Um, I'm just going to finish up um, also to kind of get back to a notion around this idea of rights of nature that I mentioned earlier. As it stands today, the law sees nature as a property. Okay? Nature is property under the law. Nature has no rights within the governmental framework, within the legal framework today. It doesn't recognize nature in that way. It recognizes it as property. So if you can wrap it up in that for just a second and then put next to it the fact that there was a time in our own history that people were property, okay? African Americans were property, women were property. So when those ideas were initially launched at folks, the folks who were bringing up this reality that those people need to be seen as people and have rights, um, that was a very ridiculous, crazy, you know, unfathomable notion that you could actually be wanting to recognize women as having rights, African Americans having rights. I think in a lot of ways, the rights of nature has had to go through that same sort of battle of saying, well, that seems ridiculous. How could you do so? Um, but I think that tide is starting to turn because we understand that we don't live inside an economy term. We live inside an ecology and everything has to sit within the balance of what they are going to provide. So I think the rights of nature idea, uh, which really had its founding, at least in this country, in a small community in rural Pennsylvania, that was dealing with sewage sludge, they became the first community to actually look at nature not from property orientation, but from a rights orientation. From that same time, you know, it's evolved out into about 36 other communities, uh, the country of Ecuador now, um, because of what Pennsylvania did, it's kind of recognizing those rights. So there's, there's something that's shifting around people's view about where, where human boundaries really are. Um, and I think law is, is, is very, very far behind in that realm. Uh, and that's, that's also being pushed by this community rights work, which is very different than other kinds of work going on. 
so much of the work we do today is within the confines of what's allowable. And we look to somehow make the best of it within what we're doing. And the community rights work is saying, well, what we have is inadequate, it's deficient. And unless we actually build new tools and go in a new direction, we can expect more of the same. So that's my kind of very, very quick introduction um, to sort of the baseline of where things are at, um, sort of nationally as well as in some ways internationally. Um, because of the work in other places, it's coming out here to the state of Oregon, and that's what's happening right here in this particular community, and the fact that Eugene uh, and Lake County is also happening right next door in Benton County, and Joseph County, and we're starting to materialize in Southern Oregon, Jackson County, also up uh, mostly in Western uh, uh, counties at this point. I think there's, this, there's something shifting around people's views about how they have to be doing things and why we need to do it differently. And so, Oregon, in a lot of ways, has come up to speed in this work very, very quickly. Um, and so, there's, I think, great potential uh, in the people who come to this work to build it into something like other places are doing as well. So, um, but they, I'm sure if you have any questions about other places, I'm happy to answer that at the end. But I want to hand it off now to, uh, to Ann Neelan to talk more about what does that existing system look like, especially from the, from the legal standpoint. Uh, does that microphone work? It's been re it's really hard to hear back here. Um, I don't know. We can try to talk louder. That helps. <laughs> does anyone else having a hard time hearing back? Okay. We'll try to project. Well, come on up closer. So I just want to talk uh, for about five minutes about the structure of law that, that Kai has been referring to and put a little bit of meat on the bones of this concept that we consider sustainability illegal and what that actually means. And so uh, I just want to do a sort of broad brush and pick up on a couple pieces of this system. The first uh, piece I was going to mention is the corporate constitutional rights. And so maybe we all know that when we talk about corporate constitutional rights, we're not just talking about Citizens United and we're not just talking about corporate personhood, that there's actually an ex a much a more extensive list of rights that corporations uh, are entitled to exercise uh, for their own protection, including the First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, uh, which also amazes me, uh, Commerce Clause, Contract Clause, um, and that corporations actively use these laws to challenge uh, laws that, that <coughs> communities or states put on the books to protect their environment, protect their communities, to stop corporate harm, and that they successfully win. Uh, and so in terms of sort of the other piece of what Kai said, that, that not only are corporations do, are not required to respect the constitutional rights of individuals, they actually wield those constitutional rights uh, to protect governments from stepping on their rights. So they, they are they're protected sort of both ways. They don't honor rights towards people, and they also are protected by government intrusion themselves. So they use these rights uh, to have laws thrown out. Um, so they're not only successful in um, having laws found unconstitutional that seek to stop corporate harms, but they also have a really significant chilling effect. And this is something we see a lot in terms of our work in local communities is that local governments and state governments become very frightened of uh, passing laws that may draw uh, a corporate lawsuit because those uh, corporate rights entitle corporations to seek economic damages and monetary damages. So, uh, so uh, municipalities or other uh, <coughs> governments can be held uh, financially liable for passing laws to protect their communities and protect the environment uh, within their jurisdictions. And so these rights are very uh, powerful and very problematic for communities like ours that want to stop corporate harm from coming in. The other uh, aspect of the corporate rights and privileges that uh, is important to understand in terms of our current structure of law is uh, state and federal preemption. And this is a tool that corporations have become very uh, adept at using to uh, to get to persuade <coughs> government, state or federal government, to pass laws that then prevent jurisdictions, lower jurisdictions, from being able to pass laws to protect uh, their local interests or stop corporate harms. And so, this an example of this has just happened here in Oregon. Uh, in our special session, we had Senate Bill 863, the Oregon Monsanto Protection Act, uh, was a law that it was a, a template from ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, a corporate. 
a lobby of sorts that, that pushes through legislation, corporate favorable, corporate favorable legislation in uh, legislatures around the country. They were successful in doing so in Oregon, um, along with a flurry of campaign money to our Oregon legislatures to pass a law that bans local jurisdictions from passing laws pertaining to seeds or seed products. And this was in direct response to the initiatives that you'll be hearing about that pertain to GMOs and also uh, efforts in Jackson County to pass uh, GMO-related laws. So these are very real tools that corporations use to uh, dismantle our democracy and to uh, strengthen the hold that they have over local decision making. Um, and so we see it here, we see it um, just last year in Oregon. And it's, it, this is not the only example in Oregon. There is the right to farm and forest, also a piece of out legislation that is in, in multiple states. Um, and then the third piece of the, this current structure of law that I want to talk about is our regulatory system. And so the regulatory system is something that probably many of you have experience in. And this is a, a system that's set up and presented to us as a, as a viable outlet for individuals or communities to participate in to be able to voice concern about corporate harms in their community. And the fact is, what, little, what most people don't realize is that the regulatory system was created by and for corporations. It was created uh, by the railroad uh, corporations, uh, the first regulatory agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Uh, it, was a, it was designed intentionally to give an outlet to the public to have a place they can complain to, feel that they're being heard, and yet the agency actually does nothing to interfere with the, the, um, the, corp the, the commercial activities of the industry. And so this is a model that was created at that time, it's been replicated, and it, it very much um, reflects what happens today. And when a, an individual or a community engages in the regulatory system, they pretty much check at the door any notion that they can stop a corporate harm. Um, the option of saying no to something is not no longer on the table. Uh, you are engaged in a system where you can make nips and tucks to uh, a, a permitting process that will ultimately issue a permit to, to uh, actually allow the corporate harm you may be opposing. And there is no uh, uh, notion that you can actually win in the regulatory process to stop uh, corporate harm. Now there are occasions that uh, communities have victories or they feel they've succeeded in what is sort of a fatal delay process where they've successfully delayed petition, um, permits long enough that the corporation may give up. But it's not because they have won, it's because they've exhausted the corporation and it, it doesn't happen a lot. Um, or maybe they've had a successful uh, PR campaign that's created enough pushback the corporation may make a choice to step out. But it's not because of people's power to say no. Uh, it's the power is still in the hands of the corporation they may have opted out. And though that's the only victory that any community or individual will see in the regulatory system. And so once again, this is a, another piece of our uh, current structure of law that is uh, been designed by and for corporations. There is no corporate capture, as some people like to think about our regulatory system. In fact, this entire system works pretty much as it was designed to work, and that is to the benefit of corporations. Um, and that's why the community rights movement uh, comes to this understanding and has developed a strategy that this system simply must be dismantled. Uh, we can't continue to play in these, on this playing field that has been created uh, by corporations. Uh, and for corporations that works quite handily to advance their interests while uh, all that we're pushing for, particularly protecting our environment, continues in rapid decline, right? We're not making gains in the current structure of law. And so what this tells us is that this structure of law needs to, needs to be dismantled and we need to build a new structure of law uh, beginning at the local level to the state constitutional level and ultimately to the federal level that is a rights-based structure of law uh, that empowers communities and people and ultimately the planet to be able to protect the, those uh, things that define us and that we're concerned about. And so the, the strategy as Kai alluded to is that this is a grassroots movement in the making and that's why the initiatives that will be discussed here in just a few minutes are the heart of this strategy where local communities are coming together to identify the, the values and the, the assets of their communities that are being uh, trounced by corporate activities and to assert the rights to those um, activities and to ban the harms and to frontally challenge the corporate rights that, that make these laws normally impossible to, to keep 
on the books. And so um, it's, a, it's a carefully designed strategy to uplift community rights and to elevate our ability to say no to corporations and to put the corporate, the corporate rights and privileges uh, into their rightful place, which is subordinate to the will of the people. And so now you see that Would you mind holding it? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I thought you wanted yeah, to just if you could hold it, I'll pick you first. So I'm Harry McCormick, and I'm uh, representing the Benton County Community Rights Coalition, and I'm a farmer. And those of us that petitioned, actually three of us that did the actual petition with this piece of legislation, proposed legislation, are all farmers. Um, and part of how we came to this was through the uh, fear that our food system, which we've been, some of us have been working on for 40 years, and this isn't the general food system, this is the one that we here in Western Oregon know of as the alternative food system, has a threat that has not got any way to counter, namely GMOs, and namely the, the pollution of our seed source for our organic food system. So, when we first heard about this rights-based movement for communities, um, it actually turned Dana, my buddy back here, it turned a couple of us to tears. Uh, because it was the first time that we saw that, we've been banging our heads on the wall in court for years, um, trying to stop this effect of, I don't know if you know, but for over 10 years now, actually 12 years, almost all the GMO beet seed in the country, the US, is grown right here in our valley, and a lot of it's right around where we live. Um, same thing with uh, GMO corn being in the valley blowing all over. So here we had a chance to stand up and say, we want a certain kind of system, and in wanting that, and this is the beautiful language that's in here, there's copies back there on the table, along with a whole lot of other handouts from our group. Um, in, that, in that wanting to have a food system that is healthy and is going to perpetuate itself through all the community of the soil also being protected, um, we have a chance to then say the people that can't exist in this system are the ones that are going to do it in, namely the people doing GMOs and doing bad stuff to the soil community and to our gut community, which is the same community. So in a way, this whole white space food coalition protects your 70 trillion cells that you're feeding every day, and then it protects the system that is helping to feed that. That's kind of how we came to it. Uh, where we've evolved over this two years that we've been working on this is um, we realized that it wasn't just sort of broadly corporations that were the problem here. It was the patent holders. It goes back to that 1980 Supreme Court decision that allowed for the patenting of life. And if you follow that decision and follow it through the pharmaceutical industry, and especially women might realize this, it actually ends up with you not only owning the cells in your own body if you take certain medicines for certain diseases. Same thing is true with the stuff that can come on my farm from my back door neighbor. I don't own it. Turns out he doesn't own it either. The patent holders own it, not the farmers. So we're not trying to pit farmer against farmer. We're going after the people that privatize life. So what's so cool about these ordinances, one of the things that's really cool about them is that we get past that privatization. When we talk about rights of nature, we're talking about rights for community to live, all kinds of communities. The community in your gut, the community in the rivers, the community in the air, the community in the soil, all of what makes a food system work. That's never been protected in Western law. I understand there's a woman here at U Lowe that has a book that kind of talks about a, further, a past attempt to do this, but um, it really has never been protected in Western law. But part of my background is in indigenous communities, and in indigenous communities, that's just assumed. It's just a whole other way of being. You start with what is the natural processes that allow us to be on this planet. And that's what gets protected, not corporations that want to do everything in. So these, these ordinances, and specifically the one in our county, 
um, allow us to do that. And we just recently, uh, thanks to our attorney here, um, we just recently got a judgment which it looks like it's going to allow us to move toward the uh, signature gathering stage to be on the ballot. I'm sure we're going to get countered again. We have all the way along the way by so-called interveners who are really the uh, corporate people, masks, coming into our attempt to get this law on the books. But we, uh, if we can get uh, into the signature gathering <coughs> stage, and then if we can get in on the ballot, we are totally convinced that we will pass this ordinance. Mostly because in our county, which is not unlike a lot of counties in Oregon, 70% of the vote is in Corvallis, and we've already had a type <coughs> vote happen in Corvallis. So uh, we should have no problem. We need to gather uh, around 3,000 signatures to get on the ballot. We want to get 10,000, and that should be pretty easy. So. I got cheered last night when I said this in front of the audience of 165. Um, it's exciting. <laughs> Some of us up here have been lawyers for years, you know, and Dana has too. This, this is the next round, and this is a round that we have to win because this is in this week's Eugene Weekly, you should all look at it a graph of the fossil fuel that is not going to be available starting next year. Wow. It's already going down, but we've got a rapid decline to 2020 here, which was predict predicted back in the 80s. This whole system is changing very rapidly, and we have to grab hold of what we want, institutionalize it through legal means, and protect what we want with these ordinances. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Michelle Holman and I'm representing the Lane County uh, faction that's doing very similar work to what Harry was talking about. Um, we came together, a group of us, uh, around toxic spray. Uh, some of <coughs> us live in the coast range. I live in the coast range where clear cuts happen and then they come through and they spray. Uh, legal. And for years and years and years, I engaged in the regulatory system. I would call and say, you know, I still don't want you to poison me. And you'd be like, no worries. EPA says it's safe. Parts per million, you can poison as much, and you'll be fine. You know, this is a madness. So um, we came together almost two years ago, maybe, yeah, close to two years ago. A group of us went to see Paul Cienfuegos uh, at a workshop. I have to admit, I was dragged to that workshop. I read about com the community rights movement and I thought this is a little too pie in the sky. I'm pretty invested in the work I've been doing for how many years, um, you know, but okay, I'll go. And somehow, uh, I opened my mind and put on the lenses to let me see why it is I don't get what I want. When I beg and plead and write letters and protest, why has this work that I have done borne no fruit, no substantial fruit? I mean, I feel good because I mean, I'm involved and I'm not sitting on my couch just eating potato chips and watching TV. But this is not, this, the point is we want to see structural change. I shouldn't have to be poisoned. My kids shouldn't have to be poisoned. Women shouldn't have to sustain multiple miscarriages due to what? Well, we can't really know. We can't really know why these things are taking place because these are invisible parts per million uh, components that enter our bodies. So uh, we did the workshop and then we went to democracy school. We met Kai and it was a, a weekend of understanding the history that led us to why we don't get anywhere. It's fascinating. When you get the history and you understand, then you say, okay, it's clear, we have to do something else. We have to confront unjust laws. We have to write our own relevant and just laws. That's what we want to do. 160 communities have done this in the US. This is the inspiration for our in initiative. The reason that we changed from uh, toxic sprays coming from helicopters to the food <coughs> system ordinance was because of the work that's being done in our neighboring county. And we decided, you know, let's get on board. There's a train leaving the station. We're going to go. And so we switched. We actually wrote. Um, a toxic spray ordinance, we put it on the shelf, and we wrote a local food system ordinance of Lane County. Um, July of this last year, 
we submitted it, um, and we were um, <coughs> given the, the go-ahead by the county, and then we were, there was an intervener, same movie as what Harry was talking same about. Interveners. Same <laughs> interveners. You know, it's, a, it's the Monsanto shill that, that they inserted into our lives. So we bit, had to rewrite and, and do the dance with the county clerk and the county council. And then, of course, we were sued after the county clerk and county council said that, yeah, it's cool, go for it. Uh, we were sued. So we went to court, actually just last week, and we're waiting for a judgment from the judge to see if we can go ahead and just get the people the right to say what we have to say. That's all we're asking. Put it before the people. You know, they're saying to us, well, you know, preemption, and it's, it's, uh, it's a done deal anyway. Let the people say what it is we want. We're not afraid of preemption. We didn't buy it before 863. We don't buy it now. Preemption is unjust law. So, uh, yeah. So, um, you know, this is about re-empowering ourselves. One of our teachers likes to say we've forgotten who we are. We're the freaking people. You know, they work for us. Right? So, uh, it's, it's a long-term process. I mean, the earth is begging for us to do something today. We want it done today. We're also realists, and we know things take time. The abolitionists took generations, went to jail, died. The suffragists, same movie. They, it took a long time, and it's going to take us a long time um, because we're, we're fighting some big forces. We're not going away. We are, at this point, this is the first time in so many years I can say that I'm doing work that seems um, meaningful. It is meaningful. And it seems like we have uh, the right tools to take on the system. There's more of us than them. Yeah, they have more money. Yeah, they're invested. But this is our planet. These are our kids. You know, we, we have some serious, meaningful work to do. This is the route. The community rights movement is gaining steam. Um, you know, we want you on board. We, we're really, really looking to broaden Lane County's demographics. We want young people. We want people of color. We want this thing to grow because it's all our community. Uh, people like to say the system is broken. The system is not broken. It works very, very well for the people it's meant to protect. So we have to reinvent it, and that's. That's our chore. So, um, as a matter of fact, one thing I wanted to say is that we are we have a community rights conversation education program, and we also are doing uh, outreach in the communities. We want to present either Kai, or probably Kai, and another speaker here at the university. And we would like to co-sponsor with uh, university student-run organizations. So, if anybody out there has a notion, please see me after the talk. And thanks so much. I have to start by saying two things. First off, just to be flat out truthful, none of us compared notes. So the similarities that you're going to hear tonight, I, you might find a little bit fascinating. I know just listing myself, I'm finding them quite fascinating, although the work is all related. I also, unlike the others, I have to be scripted because otherwise I'll talk I'll talk to you blue in the face, and we'll be here until tomorrow. So, with that, our work began when I received a phone call. And it was a phone call that a timber notification was telling us that within our community, a helicopter was going to come and spray Aberdeen near the lake, which is less than two miles from my home. And that call began a process for me um, of wanting to first bring awareness to the topic, because although my husband and I lived in the area, retired in the area over 11 years earlier, it turned out that many of the people that we knew and were acquainted with had no idea just like we were. We were all shocked to know that there was such activities taking place within our community and that they were legal. It also didn't take rocket scientists to know that helicopters spraying toxic poisons designed to kill living things had no place within our neighborhood, community, or anywhere for that matter, be it from the timber industry or any industry. This began a process that I never dreamed I was going to have to deal with. I never, never fathomed in my retirement that this is where I was going to be today. We named ourselves when we started this work Precious Dirt. We were clueless when it came to the topic both of the chemicals, the sprays, actually the whole entire topic. We were completely and utterly clueless, speaking for myself. In turn, the first year was intense because it 
was spent spending whole days, often into the wee hours of the morning, doing research. Not just regarding the chemicals themselves, but everything that was related to this topic. The who, what, when, and the why. Because the question remains today, how on earth is it possible that helicopters can spray highly toxic chemicals within residential neighborhoods and communities throughout our state, and it's legal? We discovered, at least to some degree, the, the extent to which these poisons were being sprayed. The reality is that this information is far from forthcoming, in my opinion, by design. The statistics, however, are off the charts, revealing millions to billions of toxic chemicals being sprayed in this country and within this state. The citizens in Curry County, home in the most recent chemical trespass incident regarding a timber helicopter spray, no less, um, have been spending four months since the spray trying to figure out <coughs> just what it was they were sprayed with and the state there claims that there's an ongoing investigation taking place. Another eye-opener was realizing the extensive use of pesticides in Oregon that goes back way, or goes rather way beyond the timber industry itself. This includes state entities such as ODOT, Public Works, Pacific Power, our parks, schools, golf courses, hospitals, and some of the sources of course include food, which is agriculture, which uses an extensive amount of toxic poisons on the food that we feed our families all over the state. There's also, of course, the issue of the state's support for GMOs in and of themselves toxic. In fact, more often than not, the chemicals that are used both by timber are also used within the agriculture industry, from atrazine to glyphosate to 2,4-D. All three currently are a chemical cocktail that's going to be sprayed in my valley via helicopter per an Oregon Department of Forestry notification that I received. One of the many disturbing aspects, or another of them, is the use of highly hazardous chemicals that are sprayed throughout Oregon has a long history. It's over 30 years. There's a history in this state of over 30 years. There are uses common practice in Oregon. Yet another stark reality is that these practices are increasing both in timber and in agriculture. Chemicals are considered the fast, cheap, and easy method for killing pests, sold as the solution, sold to us and those that use them as the solution by the very same industry that now dares tell us that GMOs will help feed the world. When we started this journey, we did what many, if not most, communities do, feeling threatened and under siege by corporations who hold profits above the best interests of those that live within their realm. We followed the path that was laid out by those that came before us. We first went to the mill. Then we went to our city, the council, to our county, the commissioners, to the state, to the agencies designed to protect us, our air, water, and soil, EPA, DEQ, Fish and Wildlife, ODF, Oregon Department of Forestry, ODA, Oregon Department of Agriculture, Oregon Health Authority, all the way up to the governor, Kids Hopper himself. Each and every step of the way, we hit one steel wall after another. We also, of course, reach out to environmental groups, inquiring as to why they appear to not be addressing this issue head on. In fact, personally, I found that rather shocking that I couldn't find an environmental group in Oregon that was not taking this head on. Why was such an onslaught of toxic chemicals going on for so long and yet not the primary focus of any group within this state? And it's precious dirt. Bottom line, the Right to Farm and Forest Act, the Forest Practices Act, and the EPA's allowance of these toxic chemicals were the rationale used for why no one was able to stop them. The organizations that we assume would be all over this also faced the steel walls that we did, and more often than not told us that these things take time, applying bad aids where they could while the poisons continued. For us, this was not acceptable. Time is not on your side or on our side when it comes to being exposed to poison, systematically sprayed year after year after year. Layton County is yet another example of the sordid history of the state. Their exposure investigation began in 2011 when it was discovered that over three dozen citizens tested positive for timber chemicals, 2,4-D and atrazine in their urine, and yet this investigation has actually been on hiatus for over two years. Last year, right here in this university, I was blessed, if you will, to hear Thomas Lindsay, co-founder of CELDEF, the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, give his keynote speech. Sorry. 
<laughs> One that not only offered the first ray of hope that I had felt since our group stopped standing together to outlaw pesticides, which we formed after realizing that environmental groups were not going to help us or support us, and after being shut down by the governor, Thomas Lindsay laid out a reality that finally made sense as to why all this was happening and no one seemed to be able to stop it. The system was not broken. In fact, the system is working just fine, exactly as it was designed by corporations and the governments that they control. We in our environment, and however, fall under what Thomas Lindsay calls the box of allowable remedies. All the rules, laws, and regulations with one steel wall after another do is regulate us, not the corporations or the industries that cause the harm to our communities and to our lives. After hearing Lindsay speak, I reached out to Selda. Within less than a month, Kai visited the Illinois Valley. He shared his insights with Precious Dirt, and he quickly created the Freedom from Pesticides Alliance. It took us six months to draft an ordinance that would finally put an end to the chemical trespass in our valley, actually within our county. We drafted an ordinance that would protect us from the chemicals and directly challenge the laws crafted by corporations that are protected by the state. September of last year, we filed the Freedom from Pesticides Bill of Rights Initiative. It is slotted for November's ballot. After expected hurdles from the county, perhaps responding to their shock at seeing such an ordinance and getting past the hurdles of the title process, having to go to court to do so, we're now on the cusp of moving full steam ahead. Our initiative is designed to protect not only our health, but the health of our air, water, and soil, and farms, and key, the ecosystems itself that in turn depend on a healthy environment in which to live, thrive, and actually survive. We even dared add a clause that gives us, as citizens, the right to enforce our ordinance with direct action if or when an entity may choose to break the new law when it's passed. The bottom line, there's no turning back. No more banging our head against steel walls or being confined in what we term the box, what some has actually called a coffin, getting smaller all the time. Speaking for myself, I'm passionately pissed. We're blowing the lid off the coffin because we're not dead, we're not quitting, and we're not going away. We've seen the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, and trust me, it feels good. In fact, in my view, the cell death path is the only logical, practical, realistic path forward if we ever hope to change the corporate governmental paradigm of dominance, control, and destruction that is squeezing the life out of all of us, our environment, without exception. Our ordinance changes the law from allowing pesticide practices to inundate our lives to prohibiting them. It has four basic rights, four prohibitions, six enforcement elements, and goes into effect the date of adoption. What began for precious dirt as a motto is relevant today, ever forward. Woo! We got about 20 more minutes, and I'm sure all of us are happy to stay longer, depending on uh, interest. So it's kind of, you know, the, you the stage the is yours. Yeah, Simon, 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 maybe get that on the ballot. Huh? And Joseph, you have that on the ballot? We're in the process of gathering signatures, hoping for the November ballot. Well, no, we will be on the November, the November ballot. You don't have it for November yet. We're, we're, not, to, yeah, not we're in the process of gathering the signatures yeah, to get onto the trying. moment. It was just That's okay fine. to yeah. gather the signatures. They just started gathering the signatures. So yes, they're in that part of the process. Well, Jackson County's doing a little bit better than you are so far. Jackson County <laughs> started by ahead of us, and they're already, yes, they're spotted for the May ballot. Jackson County started about a year and a half ago to collect signatures. And yeah. submitted January 2nd of 2013, so like a long time ago. So there's a, a question in the back there. Yeah, uh, on the, the suit that you were in court on earlier this week, can you give a little more uh, information again? Uh, yes, yes and no. So the, um, we had a hearing last Tuesday here in Lane County. Um, as Michelle had alluded to, we had have an initiative here in Lane County, the local food system ordinance of Lane County. 
that has been approved by the county government to comply fully with the procedural requirements to be on the ballot. It had to receive the ballot title from the county council. Uh, and at that juncture, uh, the county was sued by um, the sort of corporate forces that be through a farmer in Lane County that plants genetically modified sugar beets. Uh, and they challenged it uh, both for the procedural requirements, they called it the subject, and the full text amendment, the procedural requirements, and the ballot title itself. So we had a hearing last Tuesday um, here in Lane County, at, at just down the street. Um, and unfortunately that day the judge did not rule. So that's, that was the no part of what I have information for you. He didn't rule. Um, he asked that the, both attorneys, myself and John DiLorenzo, who was the attorney for the farmer, uh, also the lobbyist for Oregonians for Food and Shelter, self-proclaimed author of Senate Bill 863. Um, uh, was the two of us were required to submit uh, proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law to the judge, which we did yesterday, with uh, expectations, hopefully, that he'll rule maybe next week. So we don't have an outcome yet. And keep in mind that all initiatives go through this review process, whether local or state. Uh, it's just become, and I think Jackson went through this as well, it, it becomes a point where the corporate interests who want to oppose you will do anything to delay you and to frustrate you. They want you to go away. So the lessons always are that any point they can, they will. And so it's less about the procedural stuff, it's more about the fact that when you start touching the power structure, the power structure fights back. So they'll delay you in court or they'll go to the legislature and pass a preemptive law. They'll find different ways to do it. And so our understanding has to be is we have to expect that stuff. And then we have to build our, our, our resilience to that and keep pushing forward as we're hearing these people say here today. That's, that's the counter to all of this. Of course, there's a lot of strategic and tactical stuff involved, but that's the mindset that has to shift in the, in the back there. Um, my name's Kathy Ging, and I'm a member of Oregon Tills Advisory Committee. And I want to say that we are looking for new members, and also for the Board of Directors, I hear, is looking for new members. And one thing we want to start focusing on more is the GM issue, a little bit late. But uh, also, I've done a lot of residential real estate for 28 years. I'm kind of the organic realtor. I would say that uh, I've been persecuted by people in the profession for uh, putting out organic modes. And so I want to tell you, this is the first time I've said this publicly, it's been very difficult trying to say that you wanted to go organic uh, on the properties, the realtors will sometimes discriminate against you. So I'm dropping off the organic realtor from my signature when I, con when I contact realtors now. And I want to tell you that the Farm and Forest Act, was, I've been doing this for 28 years, uh, for a lot of you who don't know this, this is on the deeds. When you buy rural property, you cannot protest standard farm and forest practices. Well, one thing, there was that hog farm out in Briggs Hill Road putting a lot of pollution and smell, but then it's the spraying that we've seen that has caused the, the big issue that you're talking about. And, uh, and I'm just letting you know that it's not been easy trying to be an organic realtor and create organic zones. So I'd like to have you support the organic people who are trying to do this uh, selling property. Excellent. I just wanted to mention a, a, an omission in my, um, in my talk. The, the local food system ordinance of Lane County, is got, it's basically gives us the right to grow and distribute food um, free from GMOs. It gives us the right to save and share seed free from patents. And it does this by elevating community rights above corporate rights and privileges. That's what you're going to be voting on, hopefully, today. Yeah, you. Oh, great. Um, yeah, I think, I believe it was you, Michelle, you said uh, that you went to democracy school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could kind of give a brief idea of what, what that is. Well, it's a weekend of uh, relearning. It's, it's the history of how we got to this point. It's how we got from uh, a, a government that was supposed to protect the people, the people at the top of the hierarchy, the government, that would get, issue um, uh, charters for corporate good. The corporations would have to would be uh, chartered for a limited amount of time to do a, uh, something for the community that was good. As you can see, this has changed. Now we have the corporate citizens at the top, they like to call themselves corporate citizens, that send their lobbyists to write laws with which the government will enforce, and you and I have been relegated to the chore of being consumers. That's just about it. So um, democracy school wakes you up. You will see the world through different eyes. Uh, and actually, 
we're going to uh, be having Dem Democracy School here in, in Eugene uh, October 10th and 11th. Uh, and you'll hear more about that. We must have a sign-up sheet somewhere here, so please. Yeah. We'll have one in Benton County, too, and I think Dana has a sign-up sheet. I think at the end we'll 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 give you all our website addresses so yeah. there's a web address to learn more about democracy schools. It's the best thing I ever did, I swear. Mm -hmm. It's just it's you know, you think you're gonna be sitting in a room. I'm a country lady, so I'm not really good at sitting, but I sat there wrapped attention for two full days relearning. It's time well spent. So question here. So I was also really struck when I first heard about this and heard Thomas Lindsay speak and some of the people you mentioned. And it seems like it's not only a way of obviously addressing this whole systemic you know, structure of law, but it's also you know, implicitly and sometimes explicitly criticizing the way environmentalism, a lot of environmental groups and environmental lawyers have been carrying out. And so you're saying you need to re relearn what sort of uh, conversations or has there been, what sort of, has there been like relearning from the environment since we're here at this law conference and you look through this brochure, a lot of the ways that are going about are the ways that are either implicitly or explicitly criticized by this community rights thing. Is there something shaking? Is there like people really engaging with this? I mean, my, I don't know, you guys answer this too. My experience is when it comes to attorneys, very little. Um, you know, I think Hans an exception to the rule. Uh, Zach is here, part of the, the Benton County group, so a law student. I mean, it's it's pretty rare that you find attorneys who uh, yeah. look well, that, that they look beyond that the law needs to change versus what can I do with the law that's given to me? Because it's in essence that's the training. And a lot of attorneys, at least in the environmental world, you know, they, their careers are invested in a certain kind of law. So it's very difficult, I think, for for those particular folks to kind of get it. So it's, it would be great, but it's not a group I think that, that does. I think I think all the folks here are representative of the people who, who do get it and are actually doing the work. They're leading the charge, not not the attorneys. Well, I think it's the same thing for. Um, I'll take farmers as a group. Uh, we're used to, when we get violated, going at things in a certain way. And to do this, it's really a huge paradigm shift. And when you do this paradigm shift, I got really angry once I figured out what was going on. <laughs> I've been screwed for way too long. I'm not going to take it anymore. And so I dedicated the rest of my career. But it's gonna, we know this is a 20, 30 year struggle if all of us last that long. Um, to pushing this stuff forward because the food, very food system that I've worked all my life you know, is at stake here. And there's only one way to defend it. We've tried every other way. There's, there, on YouTube is Thomas Lindsay's keynote from last year, by the way, but one of the things that resonates for me and has resonated throughout this whole process from the moment he, he began his speech up until this moment in time is the fact that it, it's hard to grasp. It, it is a restructuring of your whole mentality for anyone who's been in a box. And most of us not only are in a box, we've got all kinds of boxes we get stuck in. But um, as far as the laws and rules and regulations, they literally do not protect us. They're not designed to protect us. They never were. They were designed to protect those that are doing, whether it be the fair cutting or the the fossil fuel or the fracking. I don't have to tell you the nightmare with fracking, how that thing's you know etched in stone, where the, no, it doesn't follow any Clear Water Act or any uh, what's the other one, Water and Air. I believe it is. It's exempt from those. It was crafted that way before they even started doing it. So when you when you wake up to the reality of the monster, when I tell you I'm passionately pissed. I, I, I don't hesitate saying that anymore because people go, oh, you're so angry all the time. It's like, it fuels me because otherwise I would be so depressed. I would be literally debilitated. This is a debilitating um, paradigm that we're in as far as our species. Our planet is being raped, scraped, and murdered on our watch. We're going down with it. The oceans are almost dead. 200 species a day are going extinct. The planting is going away. All havoc is breaking loose. And so we all should be somewhat pissed because when all of that falls apart, we're done. We're toast. It's over. They're being challenged. That's the problem. You've got to wake up to the challenge. Yeah. So, Susie, and then 
Okay, my question is technical. You said there are 160 communities that have passed laws. How many of these communities have won the challenge? So, we, uh, good question. So, there's basically 100 and I guess 55 of them still on the books, so to speak. So, only a handful have been challenged. Um, part of the difficult thing, I think, in regards to this work is we're looking for, for legal solutions in a legal system that doesn't want to recognize what we're putting forward. So we have this, this oil and water stuff going on. So the legal stuff um, has its own challenges and ability to sort of crack things open in the way that everyone's laid out here. In all the cases where those laws don't stand anymore, it was the choice of the elected officials, either small rural townships in Pennsylvania, they chose to rescind their ordinances. In essence, the corporate pressure was big enough that they said, well, we're gonna get screwed here financially, mostly, that we can't bear the pressure anymore, we're gonna rescind the law. So it's another testament about where is where's the resilience going to be? Well, I, I think in our view it has to be in the people because even our elected officials are vulnerable because they themselves enter a flawed system. And there's so many pressures, real pressures, real consequences for when you step outside that box. And so it's just another reality of what we're facing in the so-called legitimate system today when we're actually embarking on trying to do a new system. And so it's in some ways it models, you know, similar people's movements in the way that it was using law to change law, or it was breaking unjust law to try to create and instill just law. So it has a different edge to it because you're doing it collectively. You're actually doing it through lawmaking, not just with breaking law from a criminal standpoint, but actually seizing your own government in a lot of ways to actually institute rights-based law. So much of our law today really is not rights-based. It's really property and commerce-based. We try to wedge rights into that system, and that's, in a large degree, I think, in my view, why it's so difficult to uphold rights. Because the central core of what even constitutions are set up on, laws are set up on, don't want to recognize that. So it's that constant battle. And I think it is that evaluation of others that are here today in other places that is a, a, a need to really restructure what the system is about. And of course, the ecological factor is the, should be the major motivator for, for all of us. Question here, and then the original question, who left in his back end? Well, my, my, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Um, I would like to introduce into the lexicon that we're not talking about a paradigm shift. We're talking about a paradigm somersault. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. with reference yeah. to your background in the indigenous um, awareness, uh, the somersault comes into existence as um, an ancient Celtic uh, ceremony in honor of the return of the salmon. Um, and the somersault was something that people did as a ritual uh, in the ceremony. And it had, based on the recognition that the salmon used the dynamics of the river cascading to flip themselves up to a higher level. Yeah. And that's why I suggest that we may should all talk in a somersault here. Somersaulting, we're not shifting, right? <laughs> 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 I second the somersault idea, but I'm sorry that I had to hop out. But I, I, I wanted to check a quick pseudo announcement, just given the clue that if anybody is a political organizer interested in the type of like community rates, community level, law changing, the campaign to ban GMOs in Jackson County is looking for a field organizer. If you have political experience, see me after. Uh, but my question was, uh, and you have to be able to start like this week. Joseph uh, <laughs> <laughs> needs one too, by the way. <laughs> uh, the, the question I was going to ask is, is, is and, and I, I've been to democracy school, I really like the local organizing model, and I don't think environs are running enough local actual ballot measure campaigns where you can. My question is, is a little different, though. Uh, and I'm sorry, I forget if you, you uh, uh, went to the, the, the lawyer in, in the crowd. Uh, have you looked at the potential with the idea that all, all the corporations are, are creatures of the state, right? The state law creates them. And, and so theoretically, it would be, I've contemplated whether there is a chance to like modify state law 
to inherently tweak the creation documents, the, the formation right of, of powers of the corporate creation laws in a way which neutered them to an extent that they couldn't exercise the rights. Uh, you know, it would seem to create an interesting conflict for state rights advocates on the Supreme Court. How does, how does a corporation get power if the state that creates them essentially limited them at their birth? Yeah, I mean, I, and I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about that, but you're essentially sort of recreating the law that was how it was at the beginning exactly. of the country, right? Yeah. Reinstituting exactly. um, uh, limitations on corporate power. And I, you know, I think the challenge is, is that that was successfully undermined by states like Delaware that sort of eliminated the mall and then all the corporations were able to, you know, gain status in, in a state where there were no limitations and then all the states sort of crumbled. So I think you're, you would be pushing back against that same tide um, and whether you could do that through a through the legislative mechanism. I, I think you're, you have the challenge of doing it with the, the same structure that's been letting them loose. We, yeah, we also have a we have a Supreme Court decision that's problematic with that thinking, which is the Dartmouth case. Because the Dart, I mean, you can read about it more complicated than we have time here, but I mean, in essence, what that cuts loose is that um, that when the when this when the corporation is created, it's not actually chartered in the same way that a municipal government's charter. So. When a municipal government's chartered, it's the state that does create it, and it's the state that controls it. So all the power comes down from the state. When a corporation is chartered, it's actually in a contractual -like relationship with the state. So it's equals with the state. So it's, it's already at a point where the state doesn't really control the corporation. When you have corporate charter violation stuff, of which you can go after the most egregious corporations, but even that's a very difficult task to do. But the basic thing that's unfolded because of the Supreme Court decision, which is a lot of the box that Anne laid out earlier, is also the things that we keep running into because that's, again, all stuff pinned to what? Well, that's constitutional stuff. So when we talk about structural, we're talking about the Constitution itself has spawned all, a lot of this stuff that we run into. So when we talk about restructuring, it's down to the actual Constitution itself because it's, it's part of the problem. So it's, it's all stuff that we've all dug our minds around and then you know, we run into, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, very illogical explanations, but in a lot of ways, a lot of Supreme Court decisions are extremely illogical. And we try to really make sense about how could we make that decision. In fact, then that particular decision was only saying that corporations are in a contractual relationship. They also made a side decision to say that this, this relationship doesn't pertain to many municipal corporations. So they maintain that municipal corporations, your government, are still under the power of the state. So it, it thereby further handcuffs us at the local level. We want to try to do things for the good of our community. So it gets really messy and nasty when we start to really look into it, which is a lot of what the democracy school tries to lay out for folks and that kind of stuff. Can I respond to this gentleman right here? I wanted to just mention that when you talk about who's, who's open-minded about this stuff, um, living in the Coast Range, we live around plenty of rednecks. And it's a really interesting thing because this, this mentality of the community rights model, tra it, just, it transcends all political stripes. You can talk to um, a redneck about corporate um, power and they're as pissed off as you and I. Nobody wants to be told that this is how it's gonna be. You know, we're not gonna talk about gay rights or abortion rights, but when you talk about corporate in incursion into your life, this really brings us together. And it's not just about the local food system, it's not just about pesticides, any issue you can think of, we are fighting corporate power. That's, that's the big problem here. We have to take our, our eyes off our single issue and put it on the big issue of corporate incursion into our lives. We got a few more minutes. Um, Charlie in the back, and then two people last question. So, so related to his thing, that the government decision wouldn't really affect what he's talking about, because that was just that when the corporate charter is made is a contract. But if you initially make it with the kind of things he has in mind, it would enforce the contract with those things in mind. So that sort of could change in that manner. If it, if it was actually a state law that changed the way corporations were charter. So that actually could work. It would not fight against the government decision. So at what point 
does it make sense to consider that changing the whole machine gets us off track and we start corporations that have their articles of corporation protecting our soils or you know, meeting it at that same level? Where if, if a nonprofit isn't having the same rights where a corporation can come in and trump or personal rights or me wanting to feed my kids from a healthy garden doesn't have rights. At what point do we come in and meet at the corporate level and say, well, it's not all that tricky to start a corporation. And if our corporate corporate rights are so much stronger, then why don't I why don't I meet it there and start corporations that that can make a difference in that place? It's Ironically, all the work we're doing is has to be incorporated in the state of Oregon. So I am like the chair of two boards that are incorporated in the state of Oregon in order to do this work. It's a great irony. <laughs> There's a lot to that. Two, two quick things. One is, well, we could incorporate, yes, we assume the same rights, but can we exercise them in the same way as the large corporations can? I think most answer is no, we don't have the wealth and power. Secondly, it's not just the corporate rights piece, but it's also the state and the federal preemption piece, the constitutional piece. Corporations are, are not only exercising the rights orientation, they're also utilizing the other governmental structures that aren't really corporate rights based to their advantage and against us. So it's, a, it's much bigger than just the corporate form. And the reality is, it, right now, it's the corporate form who's the major violator out there. Previously, it was single white male individuals in the country form. So we have to look at, in some ways, challenging ourselves who should be making the decisions. I think that's a lot of the questions being laid out by these ordinances really blueprints for almost new constitutional structures that don't get bogged down into the entity-specific rights, but actually fundamentally get back to what rights are about and what government is about and who should be making decisions. So stripping all that away and in some ways starting fresh. And I think that's the liberating feeling about the work for folks is to start from that vantage point because everything else becomes so complicated and convoluted it's awfully difficult to do anything with it now. Plus, it's not just one channel, there's multiple things that have to be addressed. And that's the complexity of it, and that's the size of this work is what makes it so big. Be sure to give your contact information. Some of you didn't even say your names. And I want to say, go to bcorporation.net. There's 800 new types of corporations in the country that are yeah. hybrid between nonprofit okay. and business. One more question I'll, here. I'll see. Okay. So we have a table. We have a table at the end at the law building at the far end. There's a table that has all three of our organizations and our ordinances on that table for you. 